we are back here for the Q&A. First of all, I want to thank all those heroes here that are staying until the end. Thanks a lot. Uh, for those who just joined uh, this uh, room, this conference, uh, we have been speaking first with uh, Brandon Bryan, uh, former drone pilot who uh, told us uh, his experience and uh, when and how he decided to step out. Then we spoke with John Good, uh, an investigative journalist that uh, told us about a concrete case in which uh, Germany uh, played a role in, the, uh, target, in a targeted killing, uh, a really, uh, let's say, controversial one. And then we spoke with uh, Chantal Meloni, who is a criminal lawyer. She gave us the, uh, the, the legal context the, she describes the legal gray zone in which those uh, targeted killings are uh, perpetrated. And then we spoke with uh, Marek Tushinsky, an activist, and he told us about uh, what strategies and techniques uh, activism can, uh, can deploy to, uh, let's say, explore this, uh, this uh, uh, lack of transparency and create awareness. Um, I will start now making uh, a question to all of them, uh, and then I ask you to be uh, like uh, quick with the answers, so then you have the space to, <laughs> to answer. So I wanted to ask, uh, uh, Brendan, the first question I wanted to, to ask you was uh, about uh, the consequences uh, of your decision. I mean, the cons not only the personal ones, but uh, also legal ones, or for example, if uh, the government like made a kind of, uh, any kind of pressure on you after you decide to go public and talk more and more about uh, what happened in the cockpit when the uh, targeted killings were perpetrated. This guy. Hello? Um, so, <laughs> Hello? Okay. Um, so, uh, the strange thing is, is I've never really gotten an official response from the United States government. In fact, the only time I've ever talked to the government was when the FBI called me about three weeks ago and told me that I wasn't in trouble, but someone was coming after me and they wanted to warn me. So that was like the only time... Uh, the, <laughs> So, and it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't Muslim, it was a conservative right-wing Christian group, um, unfortunately, Christian patriots. And um, so, that's the only time like, I've ever had an official government person say anything to me. But they've made my life a pretty, pretty difficult circumvently, more like the fact like coming back from the United States after doing certain things, trying to get through, you know, security, TSA, and just having to do a bunch of stupid, random bullshit. Um, uh, dealing with the VA, having the VA, uh, Veterans Administration of the United States, uh, you know, dealing with a physical injury as well as a mental injury and giving them, getting them to acknowledge that. I'm still, I'm still dealing with that. Uh, getting the proper care that I need. Um, uh, it's, it's just been one thing after another, but uh, they really haven't done nothing official. Uh, the only people that have come against me as far as they send me messages are angry veterans, angry Americans who think that I'm a traitor, as well as the, my pretty much every, I'd say about 90% of my former peers and colleagues have, have disowned me in some shape or fashion. On the other end, I wanted to jump to Chantal and ask you, uh, can we imagine a future where um, Brandon could be uh, prosecuted for war crimes. I, I, I've actually, I, just before I pass this on, like I've actually stood in front of the UN and said you guys can persecute me for war crimes if you want to. And they said it wasn't, wouldn't be necessary. <laughs> uh, okay, now this is not an easy, <laughs> an easy question. Let's say that as I said before, I believe that the targeted killings that are committed, well, through drones or with other methods, uh, 
in contravention uh, to the principles uh, that I said exist, we are not in a gray zone, um, can amount to war crimes. Uh, and of course, uh, to be a crime, a fact uh, um, has to be composed by two elements, uh, one on the material element, which is the unlawful uh, uh, attack, for instance, against someone who's not, a ci who's not a military. If you attack a civilian uh, instead of a military, this is an uh, unlawful thing. But this is not enough uh, to establish criminal responsibility. You al also need what is called the mental element, uh, meaning a criminal intention or at least negligence, which amounts uh, to something criminally uh, <coughs> relevant. Uh, so in the case of war crimes, uh, of attacking civilians, uh, you need uh, under international criminal law intention. Negligence is not enough, which means uh, that in an hypothetical case, someone like a drone pilot uh, could stand in front uh, of a court uh, and be accused of uh, war crimes if when he was uh, obeying the order to do the strike, uh, he first of all realized uh, that what he was doing was unlawful and intended to do that, to cause that consequence. So in this case, when there is this intention, yes, uh, someone even if he was obeying an order, can be held responsible for war crimes uh, because there is a principle nowadays which is recognized over any domestic legislation is more important than the international law, which is that if uh, you realize that the order that you have been uh, given is unlawful, you have to disobey. Otherwise, you are complicit in it. So this is said shortly. <laughs> Changing the topic just to give you some um, a topic to reflect on, uh, to think on. Uh, I wanted to ask John uh, if how is the uh, how is the debate on uh, the, the targeted killings developing in Germany? Uh, we know that now Germany is acquiring or uh, building, contributing to building weaponized drones. So soon the government will have its own uh, drones. Uh, can we imagine a future in which uh, Germany will have uh, uh, its own uh, uh, targeted killing uh, uh, strategy? I just want to say one, th one of the consequences for Brendan <laughs> about this whole thing is that the last time I saw him, <laughs> we were in this <laughs> crazy restaurant in Copenhagen <laughs> that I think is like <laughs> the most expensive yeah. restaurant in Copenhagen, some 24 course meal that both of us were kind of dumbfounded by. So there's also like, there's a strange, <laughs> strange uh, consequences in all directions. But there were, um, anyway, I'm sorry to, <laughs> um, I just wanted, to, yeah, in terms of the German debate, I mean, I mean, there was, a, there was the military affairs person at Human Rights Watch for a while, he's not saying this anymore, and he doesn't work there anymore, <clears throat> argued that drones were far more humanitarian than F-16s, right? And if you think about the Kunduz attack, where the German military called an airstrike in Kunduz that killed 150 Afghans, is the biggest killing of Af Afghan civilians in the, in the Afghan war altogether, was a German called strike. If they had had a drone that day, by the way, there was a drone there, but the guy had, was sleeping and they didn't want to wake him up. There was some rumors about other reasons why he couldn't wake up. Um, but um, if there had been a drone there, they may have seen at that tanker, the oil tank, that it was all civilians, or to a great share, civilians. Um, so, I mean, I, I mean that's... You know, there's different, do, do we want F-16s being the major, you know, or these huge jets being the major way that attacks are carried out by Western militaries? I mean, I, I think many of us would say we don't want any of these attacks happening at all, but if, if they are happening, um, there's a real question of, you know, is there a way to do it that is more humane? And so Human Rights Watch was arguing this, 
but it all comes down in the end to the intelligence, right? I mean, and that's the interesting thing. And if you, if you have, if you look at the intelligence based on, kid, on arresting people who ended up in Guantanamo, there's some pretty interesting statistics. If you look at there's you know, about 850 people who ended up in Guantanamo. Even Dick Cheney and the most right-wing Americans would say at least half of them were innocent, right? And, and, the, and the numbers actually go you know, far, for, it's like maybe 130 were people who were actually involved in some kind of... And if you look at that as kind of um, a mathematical standard for the accuracy of intelligence, you have to ask yourself in this whole debate on is a drone more humanitarian, what intelligence are they basing it on? Um, so I'm sorry I didn't answer your question, but um, I just wanted to throw that out that it's not, I mean, I think maybe that would, you know, cause more debate. Can I also say that, uh, you know, is there really a more humane way to murder people? Like, it, with this type of technology, someone brought this up the other day, but we justified using, uh, you know, laser-guided missiles and, and GPUs with F-16s as being more humane in the past, and as technology progresses, we're just justifying, we're trying to justify a better way of killing people when we should be looking for an alternate solution in the first place. Thank you. I wanted to ask Marek, uh, we are here like talking about target killings as uh, the bad evil, but then we go home, we probably watch House of Cards or uh, Homeland, and we just assume and we, saw, we see targeted killings and uh, the way they perpetrate them and then we, we may think, how oh, cool, no? Uh, or just we assume, we accept them, uh, 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 depicted in movies. Uh, um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, uh, is the resilience uh, uh, of the public debate toward these, uh, these uh, issues uh, big or, as you mentioned, uh, compared to uh, the resilience of the public opinion uh, toward the, the immigrants that die in the Mediterranean Sea, it's not that big. So uh, do you think there's a resilience and what are the strategies we are uh, uh, deploying to uh, fight against? So first of all, I'm not representing a magical number of activists that have secret plan on how to take power from those who are mean. Uh, so I don't know what are the overall strategies to uh, tackle such broad issues uh, where uh, lack of transparency not only disables any action, but also disables any ability to have a conversation. So we can't have any arguments. Uh, like in the case of Pakistan, for example, all, all the information practically is secondhand. There's no footage, there's no uh, information, there's no, there are no reporters on the ground. On the other hand, the operators and, uh, and the system behind them ha have all the information from the A to Z, uh, and also uh, like very good information in terms of footage, uh, archives, etc. But uh, we have no access to that, and b because we don't have access to that, we cannot make any, any like, any debate whatsoever. And what we see more and more is that um, this is how many of the systems that we're observing right now, when it comes to surveillance, etc., are operating. So kind of diluting the center of the problem uh, as kind of as internet works in a way. So for activists, it's very hard to actually organize and mobilize around it and grasp the problem uh, where it actually sits. Um, so your question actually addresses the problem here. It's like, what is the kind of, for the audience here, what can you do uh, in this context? What is your uh, real life uh, reference to something happening thousands of miles away? One is obviously the fact that the German government is involved in the process and there's something you could probably do. And there are groups who are trying to do that. There's investigation inside the government and, and so forth. And the other thing is actually look at it from the much more broader perspective, which I try to, um, try to bring here, which is um, we are all right now participating in designing very sophisticated civilian systems. And the systems that are used out there in the, in the warfare are less sophisticated. This is something what I've learned from Brandon, you last time when I asked you uh, what kind of improvements you've seen over the uh, software and hardware that you've been using. And I was actually shocked that uh, the improvements were minimal. Correct me if I'm remembering that right, but you said that the only uh, uh, air wings 
of the predator were extended of 10 centimeters and it comes to for four years nothing else happened in hardware and in software you had a number of upgrades but a lot of new upgrades were actually removing good f uh, functionality of the previous versions of the software etc so this is a kind of bureaucratic system between the government and contractors that is only delivering as much as is possible to keep the murky situation murky and and uh, having the system carrying on while you look at the commercial systems of surveillance are much more um, effective and sophisticated because we're talking about real money and real investments and people want to get them back, etc. And so I think when you look at the problem of, of drones, um, this is the finger that you're looking at. But it would be, be very interesting for you as an activist, a potential activist, to look at what is this finger pointing out. And, and, and this finger is pointing out of the uh, surveillance systems that you are part of and there's just a lot you can do about. So that's my answer to your question. So any question? Remain. Please, there, and then uh, here first. Yeah. No, uh, you're getting a mic. Yeah, uh, uh, my question is to Marek. I'm not sure whether you've just answered it by what you said, but in the film that you showed, um, there was a, a woman towards the end who, uh, I'm not, I couldn't remember her name, I'm sorry, um, but she said something about power and counter power and she said something about the danger of the idealism of the counter-powerful, and I wasn't sure whether I quite followed her argument and what she was um, posing as an alternative. And, and you know, I'm, I, I think you were sort of alluding to that a little bit in what you just said, but could you, do you know what she means? <laughs> uh, let me try to, try to be her uh, spoken person. Her name is Nortia Mars, and she's specializing in uh, kind of intelligence uh, that is gathered by objects such as, you know, intelligent houses and, and things like this. She's a lecturer at the Goldsmith Institute in London, and she's just written a book. So her point was uh, referring to the fact that what it needs to be reshuffled is the, is the theater of accountability, if you like. And, uh, and the way it is set up right now, it is very, very hard to take anybody accountable for the actions. So if you look at the cases of Manning or Assange or whoever else is trying to whistleblow on, um, you know, big actually issues uh, of much larger scale than uh, war in Vietnam and other things that previously were um, uh, exposed, um, nobody has been, uh, uh, you know, taken responsible for any of this at all, except those who uh, are in prison for 35 years, like Jesse Manning and so on. So her point here was that um, we can in a more engage as counter power into this black and white conversation that uh, everything the government is doing is either bad or good, etc. There are different contexts and uh, we require much better recognition, understanding of the context to make uh, clever strategic decisions that how they are made on the other side. So if you look at uh, the other film in the series of Exposing the Invisible, sorry, just one more second, uh, is that uh, we look at um, a group of reporters that are using the methods of organized crime uh, in how they actually are able to monitor how organized crime is working. Because the existing systems of uh, law enforcement are restricted by you know, local national regulations, borders, etc., why organized crime operates beyond, above. And so forth, governments do. What the US government is doing in Pakistan is outside of all the normative systems that are created out there. So for we have to find methodology and framework to target that uh, activities and not stick with other formats of activism that are working within the very constrained frameworks. There was another question there and then there. Yes, uh, yes question uh, to Brandon. Uh, could you please briefly describe which is the uh, chain of command leading to a targeted killings? And the second brief question is whether the guys that are uh, you know, sitting in the remote cockpit have some decisional power whether to take the shot or not? Uh, this is kind of uh, where the web gets kind of bigger. So if we'll start from where the sensor operator and the pilot stick. Um, you, we're just, we're, we're kind of like advanced camera crew. Like we're just told what to look at and what to shoot at. And so the person that's, that's disseminating the video feed is what we call a screener. And they can be somewhere else in the world. They, we, we, where they were at were called uh, DGSs, uh, D 
distributed ground system, right? So the DGS would, would could be like Hawaii or Northern California or even, even here in, in Germany, Rammstein. And so what they would do is they would be the ones to call out what was happening on the video feed. They weren't making the decisions, but they were just saying, hey, this guy's doing this or this guy's doing that. And then the person, someone else would make the decision on whether that's nefarious activity or not, which is the term that they would constantly be searching for. And so uh, whoever would be making that decision, probably the, what we call the battle cab or the battle captain, or someone who is in country, in the area, um, watching our video feed, and they're the ones that say, that guy's doing bad shit, we're gonna kill him. But then when this guy makes a decision, he goes through a JTAC or a Joint Tactical Air Controller who uh, their entire job is to make sure that munitions releases are in accordance with the law of armed conflict and the rules of engagement, all legality aside, they release, they do something what they call a nine line, and the nine line is, is this piece of paper where it's nine sections of uh, legality of like your location, target's location, friendlies in the area, ingress, egress, that type of information, and so that would, he would pass the nine line and have to get some sort of signature in order to pass it, and so, and there's, there, and th th I mean, that's as far as my uh, intimate in knowledge goes, but there's probably a lot more to it than that, and the people that are making the decision to kill probably are just getting a piece of paper that says, this guy should be killed, I need your signature, and the guy's probably like, oh, I you really think that this is, really needs to be killed? Yes, sir, this guy needs to be killed. Here's my signature go at it. So it's like these guys that are making the decisions really, they, they aren't involved in the process or at all. They're not involved, uh, they're not involved in the day-to-day -day operations, they just, they're just paper pushers. What about the second part? Uh, sorry, the second part of the question? Was whether uh, you as a, as a member of the ah. community there are some decision? So we're, when uh, going through training we're told that we can give the abort command and we say abort, abort, abort. And that means that like if we say this, uh, as a sensor operator, if I say this, there has to be a damn good reason to say it. Otherwise, um, like if the missile's off the rail and we call abort, we have to drag the missile slowly to a new location away from the designated area away from the area of attack. And if, if the, we call abort before the missile comes off the rail, we have to have a good reason. Otherwise, they're going to take us. If I say, if my entire reason is I don't feel comfortable taking this shot, they're just going to take me out of the seat and put someone in there that would be feel comfortable taking the shot. So regardless of whether I would say something or not, the shot would still be taken. Uh, the, the, the thing about, that he mentioned about the JTAC, just interesting in terms of the Kunduz attack, it was the JTAC who kept on telling the German... Obers Klein, uh, not to do the bombing. I mean, the, the, the Americans kept on telling him, no, the, this attack is not appropriate, and he then called the strike anyway. It's just, I mean, the, I know that these institutions all seem silly and stupid, and in the end, I agree that they are. But in terms of, as a journalist, th there's lots of information out there about how JTACs make decisions, and, and, you, and when you said earlier, there's no information out there, there's lots of crash reports from Pakistan, because all of these drones crash constantly. And then you get these 600 page r crash reports that actually tell you a lot about what's going on in Pakistan. Anyway, sorry. I also wanted to add something very quickly to what Brian just said uh, regarding how the decisions are taken, but before, how the decisions are taken in the moment where someone is put on the kill list. Because until now, yeah, everyone thought, uh, okay, the CIA in some cases or the military in others, they just compile a list and then this is basically approved. But there is a recent case then, and this is what I was mentioning to you before, this Mohanad Al-Farek case, which shows that there is actually a possibility for the Department of Justice to oppose this, uh, and uh, this case has been leaked uh, again. Um, in this case, two years ago, the CIA and the Pentagon wanted to put this guy who was born uh, 29 years ago in Texas, uh, but then moved uh, to Pakistan to, to, to train with, uh, allegedly with uh, Al-Qaeda, with the Jihad, and they wanted to put him on the kill list, 
and someone, we have the name and the family name of this uh, official from the Department of Justice was in the decision room and he opposed uh, this on the basis of other information they had. And of course, we are talking about an American citizen in this case, which makes the whole difference. Uh, especially, it makes the whole difference because we are talking about something that happened in 2013, uh, two years ago, which is uh, after the Alauki case, uh, which raised a lot of uh, controversy because an American citizen was killed in Yemen, and this was the first time uh, that gave the possibility of the targeted killing to be brought before an American judge. Because a citizen, of course, American citizen has a different status vis-a-vis uh, -vis the judges. So in this case, this guy that had, in theory, already been put on the kill list, uh, so was going to be killed, uh, was not because someone opposed. And two years later, the 2nd of April, we are talking about 15 days ago, he was arrested, he was captured, in Pakistan, and he was brought to the United States, where he's now facing charges for conspiring to provide material support to terrorists in front of a Brooklyn court, which is a crime under the US legislation which gives you maximum 15 years of prison, maximum. So this is a dramatic uh, divide between what you can get if you are treated as an enemy from the military point of view, the targeted killing, uh, rather than a criminal uh, under the law enforcement, uh, a terrorist under the law enforcement. Um, hi, I have a question for Shan Chantal. So uh, the, uh, the issue that you spoke about was uh, the way in which the United States government ju justifies its use of drones, say, in Pakistan, uh, by using, uh, in the context of international law, the clause about non-state actors. All right, so uh, they're allowed to do this because, or they say they are, because these are non-state actors that are posing imminent threat. Um, never mind whether that's a good way to go. Uh, there's an issue in this also that I hope you can speak to. How is it that these drones can fly into Pakistan without violating any laws? I mean, these are military drones with missiles. <laughs> so, um, this, you just actually triggered a memory of mine. Um, so this is probably, this might actually get me in trouble, but I'm going to say it anyway. So we actually had certain aspects of where we could go in Pakistan. And I, yes, did fly in Pakistan, uh, but without missiles. And we did fly for the CIA, but we were mostly flying so that they could do their job, so they could come in with other drones and do the strikes. So every time that we would fly in an area and we saw something that they wanted to do, like we, we just basically took all the bulk of the, the work from them so they could come in and do the fun, fun stuff. Um, but we call we, we we actually had this deal with a guy. Um, we had, we had a liaison in in Pakistan who we called Nitro, and what Nitro would do, Nitro would basically just tell the Pakistani government, "Hey, this is what we're going to do." And we had two separate sections in Pakistan on the border that we could go to. One was called the Belt Line, and I forget what the other one's called. But uh, we we had this deal where we can go and fly in these areas with the government, but. It, was, it wasn't that they accepted that we were, like they wanted us there, it was just that we made this, it was the United States probably went like, hey, you're gonna let us fly there or else we're gonna come and invade you anyway. So it was, they kind of regretfully let us come in and invade their territory. But then they would do stuff like uh, a, force, a show of force where they would fly their fighter jets around and we'd have to pull out of the area so they could do this little, uh, whatever it is, the show that they want to do, and then we could come back in. But it was, it was this really strange dynamic, and I never really, I didn't, like, there was no rhyme or reason to it, I guess, is what I was trying to point out. Just one, just one sentence. Uh, the drone strikes in Pakistan are CIA, and in Yemen they're CIA, and the drone strikes in Africa are military, so it's very different in terms of... So your question is basically uh, the only operations in Pakistan are happening within so-called FATA, which is federally administrated tribal area. 
uh, and President Musharraf at the time where they were making deal with uh, CIA and American government agreed to that strikes. And so uh, it is a total collaboration between the uh, mi military in Pakistan and the US government on that strike in this specific area. This is the area where most of the Taliban are sitting and it's the transition area between Afghanistan and, and Pakistan where Osama bin Laden flew in, etc., and so forth. So um, this is the more precise answer to your question. Yeah, and legally speaking, the case of Pakistan is tricky because as Marek already explained, uh, the Pakistani government, although not uh, officially, apparently gave its consent uh, to the drone operations. Uh, but it is true that this is one of the main issues uh, from the international law point of view. And in fact, uh, in February 2014, uh, the European Parliament, uh, in a resolution that was adopted uh, uh, on drones, on the issue of drones, uh, when concluding that uh, uh, they, there, there is a need for a common position for the EU on the use of armed drones, uh, uh, also said uh, clearly that uh, drones uh, strikes outside a declared war by a state on the territory of another state without the consent of that state or without the Security Council approval constitute a violation of international law and of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of that country, which means they can be considered as aggression. Um, I'm glad that you raised that European Parliament resolution. I have a question for, uh, for you and for Lara as Italians. Because, uh, as you may know, however important Rammstein is, uh, they are building also drone assets in, in Italy. I understand a satellite relay station, and I also uh, understand that Italy was the first uh, on continental Europe to ask the U.S. to give them weaponized reapers back in 2012, and now we're moving along that path. What are the, cha what are the chances following this resolution, which also said that drone strikes are basically illegal uh, and also uh, called on the member states not to assist them, not and in fact to prosecute uh, potentially on their territory. What are the chances that Europe, and, and it was also passed by over 500 to 47. So that means that the Civil, uh, Christian Democrats, the Social Democrats, they all passed this resolution over a year ago. And also, oh, uh, about two years ago, the coalition government in Germany, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, said uh, 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 extra legal targeted killings are unacceptable. It's in the statute of the, of the... So why does nothing happen in Europe? Is there a chance of European cooperation across different countries to, Europe says they don't agree with the war on terror, the legal framework of the US? Or is it like Pakistan, you know, that uh, you know, the US planes can fly in there, do what they want, and then they'll let the Europeans do a little few war games like the Pakistanis, and Europe will not uh, do anything, and if not, why not? I can, ask, I can start answering to this, but I would also like to hear John on this because I think you, are, you, you know much more regarding, but from the point of view of Italy, yes, absolutely. We are very much involved. Uh, Italian bases are used, even Sigonella, to fly uh, and uh, as, a, um, as a stopover uh, for flights uh, that are then going to Africa and uh, Arab countries. Um, Italy, very unfortunately, is still uh, well beyond, uh, no, behind uh, Germany with regard to the public uh, debate on this. Um, hmm? There is no interest, uh, apparently, yet. Uh, and here in Germany, the, the questions uh, have, have been already, already raised uh, before the German parliament. Uh, there is a public uh, debate on this, in Italy not. And even 
there is a huge number of American military bases in Italy that are undercover because they are officially considered uh, Italian. Uh, so we officially don't have any American military base, I think, anymore in Italy, or maybe one. But they are all now Italian or NATO or so, but it is clear that they are, there was this piece done also by uh, Stefania Maurizzi uh, that you collaborate with, showing very well that uh, they are actually American military bases uh, that the Italian government don't, we are like, uh, yeah, prone <laughs> to the, no, unfortunately we are. So I think this um, uh, European Parliament resolution, which I didn't have the time to speak about before, it's very important and gives uh, a, a strong input uh, and I believe the governments uh, will have to follow it in the next years. Uh, and we have to do something to push them <laughs> to remember what the European Parliament uh, decided. Just one quick thing. There's a really stunningly amazing case about European complicity far stronger than Germany, and it has to do with Denmark and the Awaki assassination, right? The uh, Awaki is the American citizen who was killed and then his son came back the next day to try to find his father and was also killed, the 16-year-old who you may be seen the picture of. But Denmark and Danish intelligence and a guy named Morten Storm, who you may have seen, there was a story in Die Zeit and we did stories a couple years ago about him. Um, <clears throat> Morten Storm, who was a a CIA Danish intelligence agent provided the blonde-haired girlfriend for Awaki that he was looking for, and she was used to eventually set up the assassination through some kind of um, tracking device. So the, the, the link between an actual assassination and a government is actually in Denmark the strongest case. Um, the, the other, I just wanted to say one thing about the, the legal thing. I mean, the reason they do these assassinations, if you ask me, is because it's a lot nicer in terms of public problems to kill someone than it is to give them a jail cell and then they get lawyers and then they need a, you know, an arrow pointing to Mecca and then and there are all these things that are complicated and go on for years, right? You know, dead body mass is a lot easier to deal with than living body mass. And it's just, it's just po politically the absolute, I mean, I, and that's why in terms of the legal questions, the political side of it is that it's just a lot easier to kill people. Um, thank you. Um, it's sort of a couple of observations and then I'll fit a question in at the end. Um, the reason why Europe isn't really doing anything about this is because European countries are up to their nipples in this. The UK is complicit. Um, uh, ben Emerson said that it's inconceivable that UK intelligence isn't UK isn't providing intelligence for that, that fuels um, US drone strikes. Also, Australia and New Zealand, um, Germany. We've heard a lot about uh, Italy, the Dutch. Interestingly, in Somalia, um, I think there's uh, there's something that the European Parliament has said, and there's something that European capitals are doing. John, your point earlier about the difference between Reapers and F-16s, I would argue that it's how you use them, not necessarily the actual technology itself. Brandon, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the Reaper is very capable of delivering a missile from point A to point B with a good degree of accuracy and precision. Yes, it's the intelligence that's provided uh, to ensure that accuracy, but it's also how it's used. So I work for the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. We did a big story about double tap strikes and about targeting funerals. So double taps is targeting rescuers. You wait for rescuers to turn up. Villagers and Taliban, you hit the target again. You kill civilians, but you also kill Taliban. Targeting funerals, you kill a mid-level guy. Senior guy is on a bound to turn up to his funeral later that day, hit the funeral, kill scores of civilians, but you get the senior guy. But also look at Kosovo. Bill Clinton said we must fly above a ceiling so that we don't endanger our pilots. He wanted a zero body bag intervention. He meant US body bags, which speaks somewhat to what you were saying earlier about how the, uh, the belligerent's life is worth more than the civilian's who uh, gets caught up in it. My question to you is, we're now, I mean, Pakistan has been complicit in the US drone strikes for a long time before. There was a period when they weren't, and in my view, they are again now. Yemen has, it, it welcomes drones when it had a government. Likewise, Somalia. Afghanistan now has signed a bilateral security agreement which welcomes the drone strikes. 
and Saudi Arabia is now bombing Yemen because it's been invited to do so by the supposed sovereign government of Yemen. The United States is bombing Iraq because it's been invited to do so by the government there. This sort of invitation to bomb seems to kind of completely sidestep any of these uh, ad bellum IHL arguments. So I'm wondering your, your opinions on that. the last bit because it was very difficult to hear. Sorry. So it seems like these countries that we've been discussing and others as well have been, the uh, uh, airstrikes have been carried out in these countries with drones and other weapons by the invitation of the sovereign or supposed sovereign government, which appears to sort of sidestep the, the arguments you were putting forward earlier about how it's, uh, it, it's, it's illegal under international law. I'm just wondering if, if your opinion on that, if you could sort of clear up what appears to me to be a bit of a conflict. It's like, War by, in, war by invitation is just legal, it's like a rubber stamp. War by invitation. <laughs> well, in the case of Pakistan, the Pakistani government had an interest in having the Americans doing some business uh, on their behalf. Uh, so it was a sort of exchange, like uh, we allow you to do something if you If this invalidates my argument uh, regarding the value of international law... How is, how is I, well, for me, it is, okay, maybe something that I should have said before. One thing is the validity of the law principles themselves, who I believe they exist, they are there. And one thing is the state practice. And it is uh, very important not to, not to mix the two things, because too often in the in the contemporary debate uh, we hear, oh, but no one does this, uh, so it doesn't have any validity anymore, uh, which is absolutely not true. It is true that we have a few states uh, over the last uh, 10 years in particular that have resorted to the targeted killing practice and the drones, but the vast majority don't. <laughs> so because international law and in is also composed by customs, uh, customary law, and the state practice is also part uh, of uh, the sources of uh, customary law, uh, we can see the issue from two different perspectives. Uh, say, okay, these two countries in particular, the US and Israel, as I told you before, are so powerful that they are managing to change international law, or we can say, no, these two countries are a minority with regard to the rest of the world who doesn't do this practice. So I believe we have to insist on this and say we refuse to accept this violation of the international law principles. Uh, but it is true that if we go on accepting uh, this uh, twisting of the arguments, uh, maybe in 10 years or in 20 years uh, the targeted killings and the drones will be a reality and uh, uh, there will be so many states uh, that uh, resort to this practice that maybe they will become acceptable because of international law changes with the customs. But for now, I don't believe that this is the case, as the European Parliament resolution shows. We have finished the time, but if you agree, I will allow one last question to, to close. Uh, this is to anyone, really, but what, what I have noticed is that the, the debate uh, is, is what's interesting about what Brandon's been experiencing himself is that the, his, his peers are kind of predominantly kind of a type of class within that culture and I think the type of class the type of class in this culture uh, is conscious because they've been had access to information and they know the information and I think there's a kind of weird kinds of shift like back in the United Kingdom no one's really talking about drones who are working class because the information that they receive is it just doesn't exist and uh, but say people that are in maybe universities possibly uh, have access to information or at least having a, a small dialogue if they're allowed to within universities 
And I think the issue is about uh, critical forms of emancipation and where uh, the, a kind of uh, a groundswell is needed to be examined where it can actually, where people that are threatening Brandon are the exact people that need to be talking about this in a much more uh, open dialogue rather than through sensational experiences of hate and betrayal. And, and I was wondering if anyone could suggest anything like that where that could actually happen rather than uh, kind of very well-informed, critical, intellectual debates that we're experiencing right now. But the people that really need to know about this are outside of this room. And I was thinking about what Brandon can suggest just because he's come from that kind of place himself, where those people that, who attack him are the very people that need to be freed from that kind of condition. Uh, to answer you, your question, it's a very interesting question. For me, uh, I think this debate that we have with Brandon is important right now and yesterday. This is not debate of tomorrow. This is a symptom of a problem of not well-designed system where uh, he should not exist, right? That should not be a pilot. That's a mistake in design. And it's soon, there won't be a pilot. There won't be a person clicking buttons. There'll be algorithm making these decisions. And uh, this discussion will be totally irrelevant. There won't be a problem. And I think focusing on this problem is maybe helpful right now, but in the long run, it is not actually countering the system that is being designed right now. That's, that would be my answer to your question, if I understood it correctly. Um, I think that you know, it brings up a point of, you know, I shouldn't exist, really. Uh, you can credit my mom for that. Um, so really when it comes down to are we going to create an algorithm that is capable of just killing another human being or are, you, are we willing as human beings, uh, are we willing to put the capability of uh, yay or naying a human life in the decision making of a programmer or a machine, maybe we come up with autonomous machines who, or artificial intelligence, are we willing to, to, to step beyond humanity to do that. Uh, instead, of, instead of trying to figure out a way to stop the killing, why are we creating technology and progressing towards the fact of creating better technology to kill? I think that's, I think that's, the, forward, that's, that's the future debate right there. Isn't the fact that I exist or there's moral injury or there, there's PTSD or, or any type of deal. It's, it's why, are, why are we progressing this technology or justifying further killing in this type of manner, why are we why are we debating on well, this guy feels bad about killing someone, so we're just going to remove the person entirely? Why 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 is that the debate? Why are we debating something like that? Is the question? Why are we getting rid of our humanity to kill other human beings on the opposite side of the world? I think that is the future debate. Thanks a lot. Thanks to everyone.